and a good Friday afternoon, evening, or maybe in some parts of the world, parts of the world morning to you all. Welcome to our next uh, uh, edition of our Women in Business series. Today we are talking tech, so happy to be back here with you uh, today. If you've got questions for our panel, which I'll let uh, Tammy Irwin introduce here in a moment, uh, go to slido.com. Uh, use uh, code WIB to get your questions over. Also keeping a watch uh, on our LinkedIn and Twitter streams as well. Really excited for this conversation all about tech today. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to our CEO of Verizon Business, Tammy Irwin, to take it away. Tammy, how's your Friday? Oh, I am always happy it's Friday, and today is no exception as we think about uh, the long week I know so many have had, and I just wanted a special shout-out to both our audience as well as to Julie and Susie for giving up a Friday afternoon uh, because it's always the race to the finish for the weekend. And I say that as though we put down everything at 5 o'clock, which I know we don't. Uh, it goes on throughout the weekend, but nonetheless happy that it's Friday. So, Jeremy, let me just pick up where you left off. I really am excited, whether you're good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, to have a conversation and a dialogue um, about where are we in 2020? How do we think about the impact of COVID? How do we recognize that uh, it's been a year that none of us could have anticipated or planned? It's caused each of us to step back and uh, react and respond and even reimagine as we think about the impact to our business, the impact to our homes. Uh, and I'm really excited that we've had an opportunity to partner. This is now the fourth in a series of five uh, episodes that we're doing to really ha have a conversation from women to women. And gentlemen, if you're out there, I'm glad you're also joining us. But it's the opportunity to talk about uh, what have we learned? Uh, what are we feeling? What are the best practices? What are the actions that we're taking? Um, and I couldn't be more pleased to partner with Circle Around and National Association of Women Business Owners. They've played a key role as we've uh, put together this series of, uh, of five conversations to really focus on uh, everything from sports and finance to today really being about uh, two powerful and incredible CEOs uh, that are sharing their time, their thoughts, and their insights. So uh, let me, with that, uh, go to an introduction, uh, Susie uh, Rue, uh, who is the co-founder and president of Q&A. So Susie, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and Julie Sweet, who's the CEO of Accenture. Uh, most of you know that Accenture name around the globe. So, Julie, thank you for joining us as a trusted partner uh, as well. Uh, and what I thought I would do is let each of them introduce themselves. And what I've asked them to do is not only give us their CV introduction, because we all have one, uh, but to tell us something we might not know about them that might not be found on their uh, CV. So, uh, with that, Susie, I'm going to ask you to start, if you would, please. Absolutely. Thank you, Tammy. I'm, I'm so thrilled and honored to be speaking today with both you and with Julie. And, you know, nice to meet you to everyone who's here. Uh, my name is Susie Rue. I am an entrepreneur and an investor. About two years ago, my co-founders and I started a company called Q&A. And we're a little bit stealthy, but we are in the music and technology space. And um, my co-founder, Troy Carter, and I have been working together for five years and I joined him um, to invest in early stage companies. And his background is that he's a longtime music manager and, and music and technology executive, having managed Lady Gaga and John Legend and Megan Trainer and incredible global artists. And over the past five years, we've invested in incredible early stage entrepreneurs. So about two years ago, we thought about our next five years and text next 10 years and decided to start our own company, Q&A, where our mission and vision is to power the business of music. And that's through technology, through talent management, and through um, empowering the business of dreams, as we call it, for our artists, for our team, and for our community and partners. Um, something that's not on my CV, it is on my Twitter bio that I am blessed with immigrant hustle, immigrant entrepreneurs, parents. And um, I got to this country, the United States in 1992. And what's not on my CV is that my first word was banana in English. And it's, it, I, that's, it's only banana because uh, banana is also banana in Korean, it's banana. So I am uh, blessed with immigrant small business entrepreneur parents who my very first cell phone was a Verizon cell phone. So I've been a Verizon business customer 
So they were they were very they're very smart people. I can tell wisdom throughout. Uh, Susie, what a what a great introduction, and I I love that you're an invest in the investment space. You're an entrepreneur. You're really trying to imagine and innovate on top of platforms, which is so incredibly exciting as we think about the future. And thank you for sharing a piece of who you are, your immigrant background. As we think about 2020 and all that we've experienced, the conversation around racial injustice will be part of what we talk about today. So uh, thank you for sharing so openly and freely. You have an exciting role, uh, and I couldn't be more delighted to have you with us today. So thank you so much for participating in this dialogue and conversation. Julie, over to you. Great. Thanks, Tammy. Well, it's fun to get to meet Susie. Uh, Tammy is someone I've gotten to know over the last year, and I do think it's uh, so important that as uh, as leaders and uh, women in business and technology that we connect. And so I'm super excited to be a part of today's panel. I uh, run a company called Accenture, as Tammy shared, which is a big company, so it's on the other side of the spectrum. We have over 500,000 people. We operate uh, around the world uh, globally, and uh, we help companies really with their hardest problems uh, everything from you know going online and being uh, super digital to your digital core moving to the cloud uh, to your operations, so really broad across 19 industries. And uh, I have been the global CEO for about a year now, and my kind of it's on my it's on my CV, but it's one of the fun things is I started as a general counsel, so uh, not not that normal. Uh, let's see, I'll give you two facts. One fun, not so, and then not so fun, but I think relevant to women. Uh, so the not so fun fact is I am a breast cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and that certainly does uh, kind of give you, just, you know, change your worldview a little bit. Um, and so I had breast cancer when I was 46. Uh, I have two daughters, so that was their 12 and 14. So they were pretty young. That was, of course, a, a difficult experience, but um, a very fortunate ending. And then, um, Sort of a, a, a little known fact about me is my first vehicle I bought when I was 13 years old. It cost $161 and it was a 125 Yamaha motorcycle. Oh. And my family and I used to go off roading, and my daughters, they asked me to ride a motorcycle themselves on or off the road. I would say no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I go out camping and uh, off roading. So, kind of a fun fact. That's awesome. And Julie, thank you for sharing openly about breast cancer. It is Breast Cancer Awareness Month this month. Uh, and so, it's something certainly as women, we should be talking about the importance of. Uh, early detection and mammograms, and I know that wasn't part of our agenda today, but I have to just pick up there and say, so powerful to share that story uh, of survival and uh, really the importance of early detection. So thank you. Uh, and one to other. No, uh, so I'll yeah, add one, to that point. I, I found it because I had my mammogram. So early yeah. detection is it's all about early detection. Well, and I think we talk about that, and we talk about oftentimes about self-care, and we make it sound like it's easy. It's not easy, particularly in a COVID environment where there's so much going on. But I would just urge each of us to remember, put yourself first, because when you take care of yourself, you have so much more left to give back to others. Uh, listen, I would also be remiss, Julie, if I didn't just acknowledge one other thing that is not a surprise to the world, but was announced this week, and uh, that is the list of Fortune Top 50 Women. Uh, and uh, while I was delighted to be on that list, I was even more excited to see you take the number one spot on that list. So uh, big congratulations and a shout out to you for uh, your commitment to women, women in leadership roles, uh, and ha having a CEO position is a really important role as we think about how do we set the stage for other women uh, behind us. So a big congratulations. Listen, I want to move into the topic of COVID because there's so much that has happened. I think about our business in a COVID environment, what we've learned in 2020, what we still have to experience and learn. And there's been some themes for us as we've looked at uh, COVID coming in in the first quarter. Uh, we took a very strong position that uh, we needed to care for employee safety first and foremost, followed by a commitment to how we serve our customers, recognizing the critical nature of connectivity uh, and the services that we provide. And then the importance of two, two other stakeholders, uh, both our shareholders as well as society at large. I know each of you have talked about how COVID has impacted your business, 
how it has perhaps changed how you think about your role as a leader, uh, and also perhaps how we think about recovery and reimagining business on behalf of our partners and uh, the customers we do business with. So, uh, Julie, I'll ask you to start with that uh, thought, if you would, please. I know it's not just been COVID, but the economic impact of that, uh, as well as social injustice. And, boy, I'd be remiss if I didn't say we're 12 days out uh, till the election. So it's been a full year in 2020. But talk about COVID and the impact, if you would. Sure. Uh, you know, I uh, so my first year as CEO was last year, and we have a funny fiscal year. It ends August 31st. So I literally had six months with no COVID and six months with COVID. So, uh, you know, it was kind of an extraordinary first year. And our, our business has been impacted by COVID, as really every business, even those who are less impacted. I think um, maybe I'll take a – the angle I might take now, Tammy, is because I think – you know, there was a lot as companies, small, medium, and large size companies responded, you know, very quickly. There's, of course, been, you know, devastations in parts of the uh, economy that, you know, have still not come back and that. But one of the things that we are at Accenture doing now and talking to a lot of our clients about is the mindset shift that needs to happen in that, um, you know, the social, economic, and financial crisis is not over. But what we were beginning to see was that if we didn't recognize that we really have a new reality, because there isn't, this isn't a crisis with a finite ending and there's a ton of uncertainty, that the impact on people for, of like waiting, right, mm -hmm. and maybe not adjusting. So at the beginning, there was a ton of activity. And then there was this sort of, I think, a sense of, well, okay, when the vaccine's going to come or that. And so when we started our fiscal year, we literally said to our 500,000 people, like, we're turning a page. We're no longer navigating a crisis. Together, we're facing a new reality. And in that new reality, we have to operate different. We have to have different skills because there's so much uncertainty and volatility and the need for change. We're all seeing it now as different countries around the world, you know, some going lockdown, some, you know, that lots of questions about remote working. But the point is that there isn't some known end or known change, but that as individuals and as companies, we actually have to face that. And we, 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 um, last week we launched a new brand, our first time in a decade along with the purpose and strategy, but the brand was let there be change. And I like it. Like it. It, it, it was perfect. It was, we was doing that work before COVID and COVID really tested it because I think we all have to, as individuals and as companies, embrace change, focus on making it for the benefit of all, uh, and accept that we are in this kind of new reality where pre-COVID we said it was all about change, but it's very different. Now we really know what it's all about change. So but those are my thoughts now. And I, again, I, I think it applies to each of us as an individual, as well as as a company. Yeah, I think that's so well stated when you talk about let there be change. Uh, it's such a kind of um, unended change as we think about the uncertainty of it. And I think for so many, uh, that has made it really, really hard. And so it redefines change and it acknowledges the possibilities of change. Susie, I know you've talked about in your business as you think about kind of looking forward in a COVID environment. Would love to get your thoughts on COVID, how it's impacted your business, how you're thinking about the look forward. Sure, Tammy. Um, I would say the last seven months have been just so devastating. And mm -hmm. um, I really feel our whole team really feels for the communities that are still financially struggling and will financially struggle for many months and years to come. Um, I personally feel grateful and lucky that um, in terms of thinking about change, uh, one of my personal mottos have been the Heraticlis uh, phrase of change is the only constant, change is inevitable. And I grew up as a, as a young professional at the time of the last recession in 2008 and 2009. Um, I was a senior in college while watching Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers become no more and an early a student anticipating a career in finance. And so, you know, 
the the thought of there is no plan B, have to figure out a new plan has um, resonated with me. And as as now stepping into the leadership role of a co-founder of a young small business that is barely getting started, you know, we are early in our journey, having to motivate and 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 set calm on behalf of almost 30 teammates, um, having to let go of an office and having to embrace fully remote work, having to think about how do we encourage people digitally and virtually when we don't have the ability to see each other face to face of such a young small team that's just starting to develop a culture. And then working in the music industry where the live industry of touring musicians and artists where so much of revenue and so much ability to meet fans face to face comes into play, how do we think about reinventing models and, and thinking from a place of first principles of new creativity and finding hope where there's just a lot of chaos. And so um, I think one thing that I'll share is that in learning how to communicate with our team, and my goodness, our team is 30 in comparison to 500,000, um, <laughs> what's been very appreciated uh, is constant communication and even one-to-one -one communication with every team member with especially big changes that are gonna impact teammates. And you know, with that, um, I feel like we've, our company at least has come out of having to make really difficult decisions and have come out on the other side stronger and more cohesive and more mission aligned. Yeah, so, so much to unpack there as you talk about change being constant, the importance of calm, and yet the power of communication. I oftentimes say there is no such thing as a casual conversation because it is about how you communicate, who you communicate, when you communicate. And I also love that you took us back to a time when it was dark days for you coming out as a new college grad into a work environment because it proves the power of resiliency. Um, I'd love to get your perspective as you redefine kind of new models for your customers, the music industry being a great example of that. How do you think about tech and the role tech plays there? Uh, I know we're having a number of conversations with customers around the globe about the power of 5G and technology and how we unlock that for customers in their digital transformation. But we're all being forced into real-time transformation and you talked about that. How do you think about tech and the role tech plays in that transformation? It's really inspiring to think about today as the best time to be an artist in the music industry in that if you think about 20, 30, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, mm -hmm. distribution channels were really locked through yeah. physical retail, Walmart, Best Buy, Target, and you know where fans can go and buy CDs and um, and another world vinyls. And mm -hmm. thinking about like the lifetime value of a customer, and you've put poured years of work into a body of work, and the lifetime value is ten dollars for a CD or twenty dollars for a special package. And now with technology, over the past 15, 20 years with Spotify and SoundCloud, and then with the big technology companies of Facebook and Amazon and Google coming into play with streaming platforms, and then even thinking about social platforms that have the ability for an artist to create like one-on-one -on -one relationship with the fan, the distribution channels have been unlocked. That's on the consumerization of the music industry and the access for artists and fans. But then if you think about the enterprise side of the industry, and that's where we're focused. Um, and enterprise is a, a big word. Modern workflow for teams is how we think about it. And to think about the old paradigm of being the major labels that have incumbent deal structures and legalities and complexities, how do we think from a MVP perspective of young technology companies being able to create workflows and systems to be able to get both artists paid as well as their music up on platforms, as well as their data back to them in a way where they can make actionable and thoughtful decisions and insights on who their fans are, where their fans are listening from, 
and progress in their career. Uh, that's how we think about technology. But you know, even in the last one year, uh, I don't know if your if your kids are as obsessed with TikTok and yep. platforms like TikTok, like a lot of my cousins and a lot of our teammates' kids are. But you know, new forms of distribution and audience development are popping up every day. And as a young team and as a music industry, we have we are forced by the change as well as um, inspired to be able to find unique ways to reach our audiences and and make the most for our partners and our customers being artists in the community. Wow, so much going on from going back to vinyls to fast forwarding to TikTok. And I think about, you know, we talk about tech so much in our world and really 5G enabling the fourth industrial revolution. And you absolutely are seeing that in your world, Susie. And I, I know, Julie, in the 19 industries that you serve in your business, there's so much conversation happening around digital transformation, real-time transformation. How do you think about tech and uh, how it's impacting the return from COVID, but really more importantly, how we imagine a future as we begin to hope the fog is lifting and we can look forward? Well, you know, I, I think one of the big shifts that's happened because of COVID is the discussion around technology. And you and I have done many panels over the last few years um, because of our leadership in tech and where we were still talking about the value of tech and all of the risks of tech. And mm -hmm. the, the conversation has changed because technology became a lifeline yep. globally in every country. And, you know, just prior to COVID, we were talking about 2020 beginning the decade of transformation of every part of the business from technology. And I would tell you now, we think it's more like a five-year transformation. And to kind of give you something tangible, so if you think about Accenture with our 500,000 people, one of the, so 70% of our business is digital cloud and security. And of course we have deep technologists, but we do a lot of different things for companies. We do strategy and consulting, we help operate things. And what we're doing for this current fiscal year is we're having 100% of our people. So all 500,000 people, whether you are in our finance department or you're um, an executive assistant or you're in the mail room, or you're um, uh, you know, a technologist, we're saying all people at Accenture have to raise their TQ, is what we call it, a technology quotient. And over the course of this year, they'll be taking um, training where there's an assessment. So if you are a deep technologist, you know all about cloud, uh, then you don't have to take the training. But if you're not, then you do, and it's core technologies that we believe that no matter where you are at Accenture, you have to understand them because they're affecting either your clients or how we're going to operate. So we're 95% in the cloud, we've replatformed, and that sort of just gives you a sense as individuals how you know, we really truly believe that it's touching every part of a company. So no matter what your role is, sort of understanding what are the technologies that are either happening now or coming. And then as companies really thinking holistically about what is the power of technology, what's the value, how will, you know, what order should I do things? But it does begin with making sure you have a core understanding of uh, what's happening. Yeah, Julia, I think that's really powerful when you think about the acceleration of transformation that is happening uh, because we proved that in a crisis you could do anything. And so the ability for each of us to be students of life and have the sense of curiosity, I, I love the uh, commitment you've made to really educating your team about uh, TQ. I'm going to take that one back because I think it's one worth using. But, you know, the days of being a student and going to school for four years and coming out and working for 30 years are just gone. It's about being a student of life every single day and having a sense of curiosity. And yet it is as leaders making a commitment to help bring our people on that journey and keep them current with what's changing around so that we can all have a common conversation based on a common set of understanding. So I, I really applaud that. You know, one of the things I think we've seen in the COVID environment is that women have actually fallen out of the workforce faster than uh, anybody else. 
uh, certainly faster than our male colleagues. But and we've seen the pressure on women uh, as a result of the incredible role we get to play as moms and the CEO of our own homes. Uh, and yet it's created more pressure. And I, I think, Julie, the advice and the work that you're doing around kind of bringing everybody current on tech is a great component of what advice I would give women that are struggling with how do I keep pace. But I'd love to, both of you have had impressive careers. I'd love to get your thoughts on what's enabled your success and what advice would you give women right now who are struggling with the, can I do it all and how do I stay in the game? Julie, I'll start with you. That's a, that's a big question and a good question. Uh, maybe give you a couple of thoughts. Um, one of the most important things for me has been that I am a learner. And part of it is I was trained as a lawyer and as a lawyer, you're constantly learning new things about your clients. But um, if you sort of wonder how can I run a technology company today and I was a general counsel and I studied international relations in college, uh, it, it was because I had a real commitment to learning. And uh, I used to do something when I was first out of law school and I called it the why rule. And every time someone gave me a comment or I was on a call and I didn't understand, I would go back and ask the senior person why. You know, why did the client ask for that? And it began, you know, this focus on learning. And uh, that's how I learned technology when I was a general counsel. And I networked with, you know, one of our leaders in technology and said, will you teach me? And it was so important to me, Tammy, that my first day as CEO, when I sent out my video, my official video, I talked about how I have a quarterly learning. And I set time in my calendar and I set it very clearly every quarter and I do it for my teams as well. So I say, okay, what do, if I need to learn this, what do they need to learn it? And I try to build it into our agendas so that it's not nights and weekends, right? And I think as leaders, if you have anybody who works for you, then you should be thinking about, well, what is their quarterly learning agenda and how can you incorporate it? Because there is a certain amount that you do have to do on nights and weekends because that's sort of life. But the more we as companies and as leaders can incorporate learning, the better. And I really want to emphasize that because sitting here today in COVID, one of the things we're very much focused on is, you know, Susie talked earlier about the importance of one-on-one -on -one communication. You know, COVID's not ending, it's a new reality. The need to have human connections, to work harder, to sustain people is there. And yet the days didn't get longer. And, uh, and so what we're trying at Accenture to do is or think about things like, how can we strip out approvals that are not needed? How can we simplify things to create more time? Because what we, we know people have these bigger demands, but also when you think about things like learning, how can you incorporate it so you're not asking your people to do one more thing? And I think that's a really important message for women because, you know, if you're struggling and you're trying to do it all, listening to me saying, now she wants me to add a quarterly learning agenda, right? <laughs> and so, you know, it, it's thinking about how to, you know, work differently and how can you incorporate? Because part of the reason I do it for my teams is I pick the topics that I need to learn about. And therefore, I'm not adding one more call to my day. I'm putting it on my, you know, my team leadership. And my, maybe my last point, which, you know, I, I, uh, having, I have two children, I've gone through a lot of different things. The, the one thing I would say to, um, to people today who are going through is find a way to be kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're all, we all go through different times. I remember when I had two young kids and my father was dying, I was not out trying to find new business during that time, right? I mean, I focused, right? There are times when I've been able to learn a lot and really do things, and there's other times when I've had to, you know, take a back seat. And um, I think that it's important as you listen to these kinds of things and advice, that that kindness to yourself is a really important part of your being able to be, frankly, manage it all. So those would be my few thoughts. So for our audience, I promise this was not a setup, uh, but we actually launched this week with our earnings call and are up to speed with our broad internal and external audience, a kindness campaign. 
Uh, and it was really intended to focus on you don't know who's behind the mask. We're all finding ourselves in this environment of wearing masks, and yet that connection, that human connection and the recognition of kindness, I think, has never, never been more important. So I would ask you to join our kindness campaign. It sounds like you're already there. So I didn't see it, Tammy. Yes, I really, yes. really was That's amazing. And I have to tell yes. you, the other thing that I love that Hans did is a wellness campaign. Yes. So yes. he like said, here's what I'm doing and tagged me and I shared what I was doing. At 52, I took up tennis, which Good I'm for you. very excited about. And my children are much better than me, but I'm loving it. But I love it. I, I think it's so great what you guys are doing in terms of thinking more broadly. And it goes back to, I know your decision to say, we have to really think about what our customers need and that. But I love it. I can't wait to join it. Yeah. Terrific. I'm glad you will. And Susie, I would uh, ask you to be part of that kindness. It sounds like as you talk about how you communicate with your employees and how you think about life, you live your life that way. So give us, the, you know, you've had an impressive career. Um, you've really kind of managed through the ups and downs. Uh, you've come here as an immigrant to our country and made this your home. Uh, what advice would you give young women as we think about careers, particularly in a COVID environment? I think that my co-founder and my co-founder Troy Carter um, has equally e an equally impressive and life-changing story where he's from West Philadelphia and um, had faced a lot of adversary adversity in his personal mm -hmm. story. And when, when he and I first connected, um, I decided immediately that I wanted to join for this journey together because our mission and values were aligned. It almost felt like the American immigrant experience was similar or had a, a, a ta like a analogousness to growing up in West Philadelphia in the eight, 70s and 80s. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, a phrase that he has as one of his life mottos is thoughts become things. And until he said that, I, I didn't realize how much I also live by that. And, you know, having grown up um, with immigrant entrepreneur parents who came with almost nothing and create, found, you know, odd jobs to then um, realize that starting a business was going to be the way that they were going to be able to accomplish their American dream mm -hmm. to then growing up as, um, you know, a tiger kid tiger mom parent kid yes. to um, ha wanting out of such gratitude to achieve as much possible. Um, I think those, that reflection and that gratitude um, is what enables me to keep going, thinking about it's not just about me and my dreams, it's about um, what can I use, um, how can I be most impactful with this time? And, and with that, I think for women, a lot of the t a lot of the times I've also faced the negative thoughts and the oh mm -hmm. like how how dare I think about mm -hmm. could I do this how how mm -hmm. dare I think about uh, being on a panel with you two and mm -hmm. how dare I think about being a co-founder and president of a company with my co-founder Troy Carter and I think that it's really important for women to take those negative thoughts out of their minds and find ways to be inspired and be grateful and be um, ambitious for their own journeys. And I, if there's one other thing I've learned from Troy and my parents is take big swings and bet on yourself because why not? You know, I, why I not? Love it. Yeah, I, I love it. Take big swings, bet on yourself move forward with confidence. I oftentimes talk about facing fear head on because you acknowledge something that women face naturally, which is the negativity of I'm not really worth it, I'm not good enough. What if they find out that, you know, and sometimes we do have to fake it till you make it. Sometimes you do have to kind of practice something to get good at it. And yet I think women by nature don't have that same degree of confidence. So thank you for reminding us about that. Hey, listen, Jeremy's giving me the hook, but I'm the boss here, so I have one more question. Um, I, I do wanna talk about social injustice and then we'll get to questions. So I promise we'll be quick on our answers, but. 
so much conversation this year about uh, how do we make sure we really lean into not just diversity from a representation standpoint, but from an inclusion standpoint, from an authenticity standpoint, that we find a way to make sure that uh, there is racial justice for the black community, that we do think broadly and collectively about being kind of humanity and, and the element of kindness, but the element of respect and equality. Susie, I'm gonna to come to you first and then we'll close that with Julie and send it back to Jeremy, but thoughts from your perspective about kind of this, this journey we're on around social justice. Um, it's something that I think about every day, if not any minute. I think part of the immigrant experience is um, is I, I I very much um, feel aligned with underserved communities that have been um, impacted by systemic uh, injustice. And I think it's required from a leadership perspective from the very top to be um, vocal and to be um, thoughtful about every single decision. And, you know, speaking from a, a young company, a lot of the times, like, we've gone from zero to 30 teammates in two in less than two years. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm grateful that my two co-founders are, you know, African American men in their 40s. And so our mission is entirely about like, the mission of this company is to create a legacy and to create life-changing outcomes for our team who is majority people of color and minorities. Mm -hmm. And and with that, it's not an option for us to mm -hmm. think, oh, we need to grow faster and we need to um, focus on the, the business that is easy or is mm -hmm. um, just low-hanging fruit. Even in terms of recruiting and hiring, we are never going to say we just need to hire the quintessential prototype of the stereotype mm -hmm. of a software engineer mm -hmm. of we need to like take extra time to find incredible people that may be of diverse backgrounds. And so I think as leaders, we have a choice and that's mm -hmm. to embrace inclusion and mm -hmm. include it in every single decision or to be apathetic and to look the other way. And I think that's the motto for us of not looking the other way and choosing to make diversity, equity, inclusion a part of our every single day. Yeah, listen, I love it. You think about it every minute. And uh, as leaders, we do have a choice. Um, and Julie, I know you've made a very intentional choice about making sure that equality is important for uh, your 500,000 employees around the world, um, particularly uh, elements like gender equality and gender, uh, equality of pay. Uh, how do you address this issue of social justice uh, globally with the kind of employee base that you have? Yeah, it's a great question. We we started focusing on gender. We, we've always had a commitment to inclusion and diversity, but we really doubled down back in 2014 when we were changing our business and we needed to be innovation led and diversity is critical to innovation. It's also absolutely the right thing to do in who we are as a company, but um, gender is universal. So we started there and we hold ourselves accountable by setting goals both internally and externally. So we have set the goal to be a gender equal by 2025. We're at 45% and now we're super excited awesome. uh, and we will make that. Uh, and similarly, we, when I became CEO of North America in 2015, we became the first and still the only professional services company that fully discloses our representation by race, ethnicity, persons with disability, veterans. And, um, and so when George Floyd, um, you know, was murdered and we um, sort of said as a company, we had to do more. We've been making a lot of progress since 2015. We had our first race um, disc open discussions about race in 2016. We had to do more. And to your point, um, we had to look at it, uh, Susie, not just you know the numbers and diversity, but also the inclusivity. So we announced three things. We set external goals for overall representation and leadership is what we've done with women so that we both we need to make sure that we both we also have leaders and not just overall representation and we're doing that in the US UK and South Africa 
but we also have a new mandatory training on fighting racism, identifying and being able to speak up to make sure that we are creating an environment that is inclusive. And that's on top of mandatory unconscious bias training because racism is different. And then the third piece is, and I know Tammy that you guys have done a lot of both the internal work, but, but also external work of investing in our communities, but trying to do so um, with working with other organizations so we can have scaled impact. Yeah, Julie, thank you for outlining that. I think those three pillars become so important. And this is an area where I feel super proud as a Verizon employee is that we've acknowledged that while we've always cared about diversity and inclusion, this is a different opportunity to take the tragic death of George Floyd and so many others and really take it from a moment to a movement. And we've made some very similar commitments uh, a $10 million pledge the weekend after George Floyd died to join with partners that know so much more about this to really be educated and to listen, to learn, and then take action. So, Jeremy, I'm off on my time, but I couldn't resist the last question. I say we give it an extra five minutes if we can, and I'm going to turn back to you for Q&A. Hey, that is perfectly fine with me, Tammy. Like I said, you're the boss. We can do, we can do whatever we want to. We're, <laughs> we're, on your, we're on our airwaves right now, so it's great. So a lot of the questions that are coming in, you, you all have answered along the way. That's what I love about these conversations. But this one uh, came in talking about why, you know, most of the time when people ask about why are there – there aren't women in leadership positions, the answer is we do not have qualifying candidates. For Julie, for Susie, for Tammy, uh, how do you uh, make a difference in helping that pipeline uh, be full of qualified candidates? When and where do you start? Well, I'm gonna take a slightly different angle. Here's a question that my CHRO asked years ago when People were saying, well, we just don't, you know, we just don't have women to be the leaders, right? He said, wow, so I guess we're just terrible recruiters. What do you mean? Well, we've recruited all these women. And are you just saying that every time we recruit women, we just recruit terrible women? And that is why we don't have any leaders, you know? And it, it was such a smart way of kind of highlighting the issue. Right. Because, of course, it's not about not having a pipeline. It may be you don't have a pipeline because you haven't focused on it. You haven't done the things. But um, and so, you know, for me, it's very simple. Is diversity a business priority? And if it's a business priority, then you will set goals, you will have accountability, you will measure the data, you'll have execution plan. And when you aren't actually achieving it, you'll adjust just like you do with your revenue goals. Yep, yep. And so I think sometimes the, the conversation has to start with not, well, how do we exactly do this? But as a company, you have to decide, is it a business priority? Because the moment you bring that rigor, then the answers to the questions, how do I start, et cetera, get, uh, that are just done differently because they're done in a way of how do I solve every other business? with facts and actions. Susie. I think the way that, the angle that I'll answer the question from is um, by investing in women, um, not just when there are opportunities to grow and to lead and to be placed into the next positions, but to consider it a, a full-time effort of learning and development. And mm -hmm. that, that mindset that we talked about of taking big swings and being ambitious um, you know, I think that that should start very young. And, you know, it, as young women start to see role models, I think we've done a good job in, in media just over the last couple of years of, of showing um, smart, ambitious, you know, nerdy, if you will, women that where the word nerdy isn't a stigma to be a girl and nerdy. I would love for there to be even more training and development for our female professionals to take a bet on themselves. You know, one thing that I'll, I'll share in my career as an early stage entrepreneur investor, an investor in entrepreneurs, I've learned so much about scaling teams, businesses quickly. And, you know, there are much less funded female entrepreneurs than there are male entrepreneurs. And simply put, that's be, a lot of the times because that access to capital isn't there, but because of the entrepreneurs themselves not 
placing a big enough bet and having a big enough vision. And I think that that starts so early. And so for, for anyone listening on this call, you don't need to be an entrepreneur or starting a business to be an investor. You can invest in yourself to think about not just a year out or five years out or 10 years out. Think about investing in yourself as um, a solo entrepreneur or an intrapreneur working at a company and, and, and dream bigger. Wow. I'm going to take one different angle quickly on this conversation, and that is the broken run. Because one of the things we know from uh, really learning and studying the data is that women fall out kind of as they go from the individual contributor into a manager role. So I think the more we know about the facts, the more we can lean into the actions. Uh, and for us, we've made very intentional investments in how do we really help women declare their intent? What is it you want? Um, own the opportunity, take those big swings, uh, and then really create the kind of confidence and the environment that embraces that. And so we've done a number of things. One of the things I'm super proud of is the program we call the Women of the World, which is really about developing those skills, creating that sense of curiosity, confidence, and declaring your intent, intent which I think is so powerful. Jeremy, back to you. Well, Thanks, I'm another thought is that- Yes, please. One other thought that is like, it shouldn't just be on the women to raise their hands and put it on for themselves. <laughs> There's also the other half of, of men um, being allies for women and spotting and identifying and um, elevating women that they think should also rise and not putting any kind of glass ceilings on or glass ceilings on women. So I, I love, love, love that you put that out there because my I have a very strong position around this, which is men are part of the solution. We must invite men into this conversation. This is not about women talking to women. This is about engaging the entire ecosystem, and men play such a critical role as partners, as sponsors, uh, and as colleagues that we do business with, and they want the chance to be involved. Jeremy, let's take one more question. I'm conscious of time, but I yeah. love the dialogue. No, this is fantastic stuff. I, I'm going to go lightning round on this one. Uh, you know, we talked about leadership lessons and taking the swing. What was the last big swing that each of you took and how did it land? Not all at the same time. Susie, I'll start with you. I suppose I've already I've already shared uh, the, the surface level of the story, but you know, about five and a half years ago I joined my boss at the time, Troy Carter, as an investment partner. Um, and, and together over the past five years we've invested in 50 companies. And when I started, some of those companies were Uber and Lyft and Spotify and Dropbox, and we were early stage investors, so we've seen so much through the years. And as we were thinking about starting this company, um, it got to the point where we, you know, talked about we had done the incorporation, we had hired our first teammates, and you know, we had to talk about my role, my compensation, my equity, and and. Uh, I said to him, all right, we're going to talk about this and I'll come over to your house on the weekend and we'll have a nice chat. And with that, I had so many thoughts, but the most important thing to share was I've had such a wonderful journey working with you as a partner and I don't want to lose that. And I want to take myself out of the running of any other future job offers that come to me, whether it's as a venture capitalist or technology, whatever. And with that, how would you feel if I was a co-founder in this company? Because that would be a real way of this is as much mine as it is yours. And that required a lot of guts and thinking on my end. Mm -hmm. And I even, you know, spoke with a few of my friends and they said, you know, why would Troy Carter ever make you his co-founder? He, he's Troy Carter. And I said, I guess it doesn't hurt to ask. And have a conversation and with that when I brought it up and prefaced it with you know wearing my heart on my sleeve of how much I appreciated and lo lo loved our relationship uh, he had no hesitation none whatsoever absolutely and it's now been two years and we've been through COVID the murder of George Floyd all of the things going on in the world and a, a beautiful wonderful mission aligned team 
that we've built together. So that's the last big swing. That's awesome. Julie, what about for you? Okay, last week, you can go look it up. We launched in a single week, our new purpose as a company, which is to deliver on the promise of technology and human ingenuity. We launched our new strategy, which is to deliver 360 degree value, think value for the benefit of all by embracing change. And we launched our first new brand in a decade, Let There Be Change. And it's been super inspiring and exciting to see how both my people and externally people have responded. So that was my big swing and you can go look it up. I will do just that. Tammy, I'll leave it uh, to you to take it uh, take it on home from here. Thank you all. Okay. okay. Great articulation of the last big swing. Listen, one of the things I'm excited about is a big swing for Verizon is uh, how we talk about Verizon 2.0 and really reorienting to make sure we align against customer requirements, uh, recognizing that we are entering the fourth industrial revolution and as a uh, as a connectivity partner, as a tech partner, we really lead the world in 5G and how we deploy the kind of capability that will fuel and accelerate the transformations we've talked about today. Uh, so I, that feels like a big swing that we take every single day when we get back up and takes on a different version every day, but it's part of coming back every day with bringing your very best. Uh, listen, it has been such a pleasure to spend time, Julie and Susie, with both of you. I wrote down two things that I thought were powerful that I would close with. Thoughts become things and let there be change. I think so relevant to how we close out today. I wanna to thank both of you uh, for your transparency, for uh, your vulnerability, for your passion about what you're doing. And whether you're leading a team of 30 or you're leading a team of 500,000 around the world, I hope those of you that have participated with us today have taken away thoughts, ideas, uh, best practices, and also a recognition that each of us as women have our own sense of vulnerability, but it's the things that we do, the actions that we take, the support that we surround ourselves with that really enables us to bring success every day. Uh, thank you, Julie. Thank you, Susie. Uh, thank you to all of our participants. Uh, we'll close at a happy Friday, uh, wherever in the world you might be. Thank you so much for joining.